Yeah, welcome again to section two of the elements of psychology, psych 101. In this section, we'll be looking at the history and the schools of psychology. We'll try to trace where psychology is coming from and where the field is today. So three key aims that we'll be trying to achieve. One, the roots of psychology, and then two, the genesis of scientific psychology, and then three, the schools of psychology. So where is psychology coming from? Psychology is basically coming from two key disciplines, philosophy and science, or what you say is philosophy and medicine. Looking at the philosophy stand, it started from the time of Rena Descartes and Aristotle when they started thinking about the human mind. Does the human mind differ from the body? How does the two interact? Do they behave separately on their own, the mind and the body? Do they exist independent of each other or there is a strict connection between the two? So these were the things that philosophers were thinking about at that time. Plato, he believed in a philosophy called nativism, which he says that we are all born with complete knowledge within our souls. In other words, what will become tomorrow is already determined at the time of birth. There is nothing that can change that. Then came on when John Locke also came with a different view that no, we are all born tabula rasa. There is no knowledge. We come actually to write what will become tomorrow from this environment. So it is the environment that makes us what we are. These issues that were going on that philosophers were concerned with are basically issues about the mind. And remember, in the previous section, we said psychology is the study of mental processes and human behavior. So this is the mental aspect of it. Now, when it comes to the scientific aspect, you know, scientists at that time were concerned about the relationship between physical stimulation and psychological experience. That is what has become known as psychophysics, how the two interact. In other words, if we are in this room and the intensity of this light is changed, how much of it have to be changed before each of us can tell that there is a change in the brightness of this room? This is what psychophysics were concerned with. And this is basically a connection between psychology and physics. So these are the starting points of psychology. The birth date of psychology is seen as 1879, when in the University of Leipzig in Germany, a gentleman, a physiologist called Wilhelm Wundt, established the first scientific lab to look at human behavior. So he attempted to apply scientific principles to the study of human mind, and this is considered as the birth date of psychology. And as you can see, in every discipline, the founders of that, those, that discipline uh, would themselves not be that. So it's no surprise that we have Wundt, who is the founder of psychology, is himself a physiologist and not a psychologist. So let's look at the genesis of scientific psychology. And as I said, Wilhelm Wundt is the founder of modern psychology. And for Wundt, he believed that the mind is made up of thoughts, distinct thoughts, experiences, and emotions that can be broken down and studied into their various elements. He believed that the human mind can be studied just like the same way an atom can be studied by you know, the scientists in the natural scientific labs. So for him, he believed that in order to inspect the non-physical elements of the mind, students have to learn to think objectively about their own thoughts. And this is what he called objective introspection. That is looking within you, thinking about what is going on in your mind and reporting it. That is the process of objectively examining and measuring one's own thoughts and mental processes. And this is the scientific beginning of psychology. Now let's look at the schools of psychology. Schools of psychology basically deals with the various phases that psychology has gone through 
when the discipline started. Just like every discipline, when it starts, people will be concerned that the subject should limit itself to A, others may come on and say, no, let's include B, others may come, let's combine A and B. So schools of psychology just talks about some waves and movements that are taking place in the discipline before we have it as it is today. So we'll look at them. Basically, the first school of thought that started is called structuralism, and that came from the founder of psychology, Wilhelm Wundt, and he is concerned that human beings should study their own mind objectively, just like the scientists in the lab who study you know, the various compositions that forms an atom. And so the method they were using that time is what has become known as introspection. That is examining within, looking at your own thought and reporting it. So this is the first school of thought that has come up in psychology. And it started in Germany and then moved to Europe and then to America. Then came another school of thought, which is known as functionalism. And their point of view is that of what essence will psychology be if it limits itself to studying the components that forms the human mind? So they claim that psychology should rather be focusing on how the mind functions to enable the human being to adapt to real life situations. So they are concerned with the functioning of the mind, how the mind functions. If something is happening, how is your mind changing? So if you look at the two, the distinction between um, structuralism and functionalism is this. Why structuralism is concerned instant or state pictures of the mind. Functionalism is concerned with a flow, motion of the mind. What are the changes that are taking on? A key proponent of functionalism is William James. Then came another school of thought known as behaviorism. And they believe that the proper definition of psychology should be the science of behavior. They say that, look, however hard psychology should try, the human mind cannot be seen. So there is no way they will understand it. So psychology will be more useful to human beings if they should limit themselves to only the behavior aspect and forget about the, the mind. So that is the other school of thought. So they state that all behavior is the response to a specific stimulus. Therefore, if you could control the stimulus, you could equally control the behavior. So there is no need paying attention to the mind at all. Just focus on the behavior. So the method they were using that time is simply observation. They just observe what is going on around you and then tell what your behavior is. So in pursuit of that, they believe that human beings, it is what is in the environment that makes you and not your mind or what you were born with, not some genes that you have inherited. At the time, he threw a challenge that if they like, they should give him a dozen of infants and he will mark each of them and train them to be what he want them to be. He can mark you that I'm going to train you to be a lawyer and he said the person will end up to be a lawyer. I can mark this one, I'm going to train you to be a criminal and the person will end up being a criminal. So it is not about our genetic makeup, but rather about the environment where we find ourselves. So that is the third school of thought. And then came another one called the Gestalt School of Thought. They believe that, look, rather than another movement say study the mind, another state say that study you know, the functions of the mind, not the state, and then the third one saying, rather look at the behavior. They say, no, to understand human beings, we need to study the totality of the whole person. So that is the Gestalt theory. They believe that human being is an organized person. And so to understand it, we need to put all these aspects together. If you pick one and you leave the other, you will not be able to understand it. So their popular slogan is that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. If you have the whole, a complete set, the computer 
that we have is more powerful and functional and more value than just the parts being put together there. So that is the other school of thought that also came on the Gestalt psychology. And then came this popular gentleman, Sigmund Freud, with another school of thought, psychoanalytic. Sigmund Freud was the originator of the psychoanalytic theory. He was a physician and he came up with a view that, look, human beings are being controlled by forces that they do not have control over. The forces are within the mind, but ourselves, we do not have control. We are most of the time not aware. And it says that the human mind is divided into three parts. We have the conscious, which is the part that we are aware. We have the pre or the subconscious, the aspect that sometimes we become aware of. And then we have the unconscious which is the aspect that we do not have access to. And he says that it is things that are happening in the unconscious rather that controls human behavior. So if psychologists want to understand human behavior, they should not look at the outside world. They should dive deep into the unconscious aspect of the human mind. He believed that there are three forces in the human mind that controls our behavior. And these forces, he called them the id, the ego, and then the superego. He believed that the id is basically anima in nature. It wants gratification and it wants it now. It operates on the principle called pleasure. It just wants to be satisfied and it wants to be satisfied now. And then the ego, you know, operates on the relative principle. It wants the satisfaction, but it wants it in a more rational way. For example, the eat will say that I'm hungry, I want food. But the ego will say, yes, I know you are hungry, but hold on. If you go to pick the food now, it's not for you. You'll be arrested, you'll be in trouble. So wait. When the owner of the food moves away, you can go and get the food. That way you have stolen, but you will not be caught. And then the super ego operates on a principle called morality. That is our conscience, that is our moral aspect that says, no, society does not support this, so do not engage in it. So he believes that it is the dynamics that goes on within these three identities that are found in the unconscious aspect of our behavior that controls all the things that we do. He believes that people who experience psychological disorders if there is a conflict between these three. And so he came up that these three, most of the time, because they do not operate in agreement, there is conflict, and that is what gives rise to the psychological disorders. But it says that the human being as we are, we try to use certain tricks in order to handle the conflict between these three. And those, those tricks are what we call the defense mechanisms. They are defense mechanisms. Sometimes we may lie about it, sometimes we face it squarely, and things like that. So for him, he will say that if you see somebody who wants to be a medical doctor, it is not that the person has a passion for you know, practicing medicine, but perhaps the person has a strong urge to always want to see blood, want to kill somebody. And so a way of overcoming it is just to become a medical doctor. He will be able to have access to the people in the theater room, cut them freely, and society will not be on him. So these are some of the schools of thought that at this level are important for us to understand. Thank you.